I uh, uh, threw something that, that I can only assume was a clerical error in three years ago, was um, named to be a National Geographic Explorer. And uh, for the month of August this year, I found myself on expedition, and we were in these uh, this very small tent in these sandy islands in the middle of Botswana's Akavango Delta. And by the light of a headlamp besieged by these tiny bugs, we would um, solder sensor equipment and um, visualize data and kind of upload this stuff in the, uh, in the efforts of this big conservation effort that we were working on. But late at night, um, we would often hear the sort of song of hyenas, and, and that meant that about 10 minutes from then, the hy hyenas would be in our camp, and they would uh, basically take anything they could get. So we would go outside and move all of the food into our tent with us and, and leave only anything that was locked in a tight container. And then for the next hour, we would listen to them rummaging around and hopefully that we hadn't forgotten anything. In the morning, though, if we were up before sunset, we would hear the alarm call of baboons. And, and they, too, would come into our camp. And baboons were much trickier because not only did you have to hide all of the things, you had to hide all of the tools that they might use to get into the things. <laughs> tools are dangerous and also um, powerful. And uh, it's interesting to me that when we think about tools, I think we mostly think about this. This is um, my hammer. It's a nice hammer. Um, but tools have become much more complicated. Uh, these vastly complex things that we use um, in our everyday world, like this amazing machine that um, travels along train tracks, tears up the old train track, replaces it with new train track, recycles the old gravel bed into a new gravel bed, um, that, that we can only, only really conceive of the complexity of this thing. And one of the things I want to talk about in our tool making group is this kind of axis of tools between the hammer and the giant track laying machine and where we're facilitating tools to be built. Because I think in software we tend to focus mostly on the giant track laying machine side of things and, and not so much towards, um, towards hammers. And so I, I, I specifically want to talk in our group about what does it mean to create medium sized tools. I've been a toolmaker for a really long time. I think it started with this. Um, this is HyperCard. I don't know if people recommend remember HyperCard. It was installed in all the original Macs, and it was a tool for making tools. Interesting to me that out of um, the few pieces of software that were shipped with the original Mac, one of them was specifically made for people to make tools, something which I'm not sure that ships on um, computers these days, and people would use it to make tools of all scales. This is a, a statistics tracker for basketball team, like high school basketball teams, so you could track statistics. This is one of my favorite things. It's called 200 Points of Light, and it's a functioning operating system built in HyperCard, which I think is much more sophisticated than most of the operating systems that we use these days and offers all kinds of interesting visualization um, capabilities. And what I think this raises to me is the second question I want to talk about is what, what does it mean to create bespoke tools rather than relying on tools that, that we can b find off the shelf? How can we make tools that are specific to a task? So I think all of us are working on complex problems and often complex problems need to have tools that are geared directly towards them. And then the last question I want to talk about is related to the baboons, right? Baboons are tool makers and tool users. And not s not like y not like the tool making baboon in the troop. Like you don't go to the tool maker. Every baboon in the troop is a tool maker. And yet, I think what we've done with technology is we've created an incredible amount of barriers to tool making. We've in some ways dehumanized ourselves. One of the defining characteristics of being a human is that we can make and use tools. And yet, I think we're raising a society in which mostly cannot do at least one of those things: make tools, and in some cases, can't even use them. So how can we remove barriers to tool making, institutional barriers, cultural barriers, to make sure that um, not just the elite are able to make tools, the technologically elite, but everybody is able to use tools. So um, I hope everybody in the tool making section is going to come with all kinds of questions of their own. We're going to have um, a, a, a long and, and lunch filled dialogue around these things. And if you're not in that section and you want to talk about this stuff, um, get in touch.